So, uh, reproducible research is on the uh, agenda for this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk for, I think, half an hour, maybe less, and then we'll try to do some practical work. Um, but I'll discuss that when we get there. So briefly, uh, these are the points that I want to go over. So there was this uh, nature uh, special in, in well, which was titled Challenges in Rep Irreproducible Research in uh, April 2013. And well, I've got a, as an introduction, a bunch of quotes from that uh, focus issue. So here it says, replication and corroboration of research results is key to the scientific process. Well, I think everybody agrees with that. And then they say, so Nature has published a series of articles about the worrying extent to which research results have been found wanting in this respect. So one of the editorials says that, uh, well, we generate massive pools of data. You've, well, some of you have already seen that. And it's easy to misinter uh, misinterpret artifacts as biologically important results. And such false positives can lead to embarrassing retractions, futile projects and stalled careers. And then the editor says that problems are not hard to solve. Biologists must seek relevant training in experimental methods and collaborate with good statisticians. So you could sort of see that as the excuse for this summer school. That's why we're here. I don't know why they singled out biologists uh, that explicitly, but... And then, one of, uh, well, another thing that is sort of my favorite thing, open computer programs. So there is this article which says that the problem of reproducibility in the context of openly computer, uh, available computer programs is that the scientific community places more faith in computations than they should. And that's one thing that I think is very important to realize, that uh, programmers, including myself, we make mistakes. And computers cannot do everything up till the uh, well, one billionth decimal uh, accurately. And therefore, the authors of this uh, paper claim that anything less than release of actual source code is, indefense is an indefensible approach for any scientific results that depend on computation. And, well, to nature's credit, um, I mean, na nature has a policy that states that you can, uh, well, you're not obliged to provide the full source code and there are some things that you can do as an alternative, like give an explanation of what the program is supposed to do uh, in natural language. And the authors here actually say, well, that should not be the case, you should go further. And if you analyze your result with a given script, you should put the code of that script together with the paper uh, so that anybody can criticize, well, have a look at it and maybe find points of critique. And then another editorial in the same uh, special edition is uh, called Must Try Harder. And there they say that, put simply, there are too many careless mistakes creeping into scientific papers. And the authors, uh, well, go on and say that the evidence is anecdotal and so they sum up a few of the anecdotes about missing references, incorrect controls, uh, duplications, some reserve figures and dummy text included, etc., etc. And they end with um, actually that they say that this should not happen. PIs, uh, so, so your bosses basically should pay a lot of attention to training students, go over all the results. And actually, there should be a bit more uh, space for, well, subsequent negative or positive corroboration of uh, experiments. And then they say there is an op opportunity here for minimum thres threshold journals, such as PLOS One and scientific reports. And that part, I thought, was a bit like a missed opportunity. I mean, that basically means that as nature, uh, they would rather not publish these kind of things, whereas these are, well, maybe as important as initial findings, or even more. So, yeah, that is a bit to put this uh, lecture or this practical in, in context. To the practical side of it, how, I mean, I guess you all agree that this should be done, but how do you do it if you're sitting behind your computer? 
Um, well, as any lab person knows, is you keep a logbook. So you write down what you did, what settings you used. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what I did when I was doing my PhD. I was sitting in a lab and every day you start up your machines, write down the settings and for each experiment you keep on doing that and you keep these logbooks forever. And you can do that either digital or ideally on paper. And the reason I say ideally here is that um, you can usually well, draw figures and things like that much more easily on a piece of paper. Uh, I guess with tablets nowadays it becomes easier to add a figure as well. But still this physical book where you can write all over the place and still have this yeah, leafy thing, I like that. Another, well, computers, computer practical thing is to keep a logical directory structure. So don't put everything in one directory, but try to keep all your projects, uh, yeah, not only separated in your mind, but also in the way you lay out your directories. Use readme files. That's, uh, well, another important point. Each directory that I have uh, where I do analysis in contains a readme explaining when I've worked on this, what the idea was and why certain files are there or missing. A bit more advanced is this version control systems for your script. Uh, I've talked about that already a little bit, but you have tools like Git or Subversion which allow you to keep a record of what you changed in a file and we'll be practicing that a little bit later today. Of course, you never throw away a script. That should just be there forever. But not only you keep your scripts, but also your settings, right? This points immediately back to the logbook. And another important thing is you have to document your scripts. So put a header that says what it's supposed to do. Or if you have this brilliant part where you did a lot of thinking, write like three to five lines explaining how it works and why it works. You will be yeah, needing that when you look at it back later in, in nine months time or by the end of your PhD. Um, one of the per people to first really think about how you should do scripting, programming and explanation of what you're supposed to or what your program is supposed to do was this guy, Donald Knut. He wrote quite a few uh, books on algorithms, but also a book about what he called literate programming, where he explains that you should basically, if you write a script or a program, start explaining it in human language and then put the code in between. And from this document that contains everything, you should easily be able to only extract the text part for maybe a report, and on the other side, only the script programming part to actually run it. And a few tools exist that make this easier for you. Uh, well, as you know, I'm a fan of Emacs, so I use this. Um, for people running R, you have Knitter and Sweave. Uh, Sweave is older and I think slightly less used nowadays, but uh, Knitter is something we'll be using uh, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, and then one very important thing that I've seen uh, yeah, being neglected is always write down the versions of the software that you use. Um, I see a lot of papers from people that I work with and they say, oh, I imputed the genetic data with this or that tool. Well, great. But if they don't specify the version, then you cannot actually reproduce it. A new version may be better. It may not be. You may have bu new bugs introduced. Or if it is actually better, you still want to know that they used the new version. So if you're in R, for example, basically this command will tell you everything you need to know. R version 3.1, well, it was run on a Linux computer of a certain processor type, because even there you can make, uh, well, the same program, the same code can give different results sometimes if you run it on a different processor. This is slightly less important. It's the languages that I uh, used. But here we see the packages and the versions of each of the R packages that was loaded. So basically put this somewhere in your script and save the output together with the script or with the result. So now let's see for the practical side of things. Um, 
what I want to try with you is to log into the server and then combine R uh, for the analyses that you do, something called Markdown, which is a what, yeah, markup language, and I'll explain that briefly later. And then this NIT R and R Markdown, which are R packages to combine the whole thing. Git for version control. And then in the end, I would like to create a PDF using a tool called LaTeX, which you actually will not see, but it will be in the background. All tied together in RStudio. So this Markdown is um, something to make writing documents uh, actually quite simple and all in plain text so all not in your uh, word uh, these are not word files but plain text files that you can open with notepad or notepad plus plus or any regular text editor and it starts with this kind of a header which says the title of the report will be like this I am the author this is the date and what I want to get out is a PDF document markdown can also export to HTML or other uh, languages, uh, even Word. And then every time you start with a hash, you start a new section header. So this is different from if you write bash scripts or R scripts, because then this actually means that it's a command that is being ignored. But in markdown, this means you will start a new section. And then you can type any text that you normally would like to write. So I'm doing QC of this and that task and etc etc. You can even put in some uh, well mathematical symbols between dollar signs and here this part will be actually says we're going to use R and I want to see the output of this little R command. Now if you run R and you type pi you get the value of pi so 3.14 etc. Here you see that I've used two hashes to make a subsection and you can put larger pieces of R in there just like this. You start with three backticks and the backtick on a US keyboard is the one that is just uh, next to the one key. It's not used very often but this is one of those places where you can actually find it. And in this block you say I will use R. And then you can write regular R. So here I just say X is a range of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and y is the square of that. And then I end my R block. And figures can be added as well. If I say, okay, now I'm going to start an R block again, I can plot this. And to show you what that looks like in practice, I'm going to do that. No, not that one. This one. So what you end up with is then a PDF file that looks like this. So here is this title of the report, author, date, the section header, some text, and here, well, if, you, if I zoom in a little bit, you will be able to see that we have pi over there. And down um, here we have this piece of R code nicely in a gray box to really show that it's R. And here this figure, and this is how I created it. So this way you can, on the one hand, combine your pure R and you, into your report with the regular text that you would write. So in principle you could write a paper just like that. Figures will be there and then submit the PDF and you're done. Now the yeah, bit of a note that I have to make is that this becomes of course a bit more difficult if your data sets grow larger and larger because imagine that you make uh, a typing mistake somewhere here and each time you press this make report button it goes through all the steps so if you use analyses that take uh, I don't know an hour or a day or uh, a week to finish you may want to tweak this a little bit but there are actually options to do that. So the next step that I want to uh, practice is this Git version control system. So the idea behind a version control system is that you record all the changes that you make 
at a certain time you write or well automatically the system writes who did something and when at what time and then you have to explain in a message why you made this change and this way you can always go back sort of time travel and the nice thing about Git is that it actually allows even uh, collaboration with others so you can work with 10 people on the same file and when you come in in the morning you can see okay what did the guys yesterday do on the script and why yeah is it working differently or not another thing that it allows you is to actually branch so instead of saying well today I do this and then I added that and then I added that you can say hey I'm going to take a sidebar a sidestep and really say here I'm going to test this and that I mean the original part of my analysis will be the same so if somebody asks me to do it right now I'll do the old stuff but in the meantime I'll try to make it better and better and later we'll combine the two paths again and then I will have my new version this works best with text files so the ones like R scripts bash scripts uh, well markdown text um, it doesn't work very well with things like word files and figures because those are uh, yeah, stored in a binary way um, which yeah, makes it difficult one thing to keep in the back of your mind is that if you have for example you make this R figure and it generates a PDF or a PNG or a JPEG file the idea is not to store that file in the version control system as well because you can generate it from the R file so in a version control system you only store things from which you make stuff not the stuff that you make so if you have this report you don't save the report because in principle it should be a button of create report which will generate the report now all of this will be nicely integrated in our studio so you will not see the the underlying stuff but I'll show you uh, yeah maybe it's good if we now log into the server <laughs> 